has been going on for the last month and we're wrapping it today. Uh, Dr. Lenton is here in the afternoon and then we have one more event today at 6 o'clock in McAfee Gym. If you would like to experience sports and dancing from ancient Egypt, we hope you will come. Uh, there will be live music dancers and athletes uh, in addition to a uh, lecture so uh, we hope you'll join us there. But um, I certainly thank you for all your uh, patience and uh, expert listening over the several sessions here. Um, our friend here has been to almost every one. I, you, I, did you miss one? I don't think so. Yes, look at that. So for 24 presentations, I think, you know, we deserve an award there. <clears throat> I will... Um, leave you with uh, Dr. Wafik Wabi, who has uh, expertly uh, gathered all our speakers for this series. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Lanham, and thank you all for coming at this time at 3 o'clock uh, on Wednesday, which uh, you can do something else on that uh, time slot, but thank you very much for coming. And uh, this marks the uh, last day of, uh, of this symposium, the Ancient Egypt Symposium popularly known as a futuristic look through ancient lenses. And uh, it has been a joy to know more about this ancient civilization that was one of the, it was the United States of its time, I think, and they left some things for us to get the glimpse of their uh, glory. Well, uh, stars are fascinating and have been fascinating to people since the dawn of history. Even the dawn, you can see some stars. And you can mention even today the word stars, and you get millions of responses. People like to be stars themselves. Look at Hollywood, if you like, or anywhere. Everybody likes to be a star. And one wise person said that we have, two days ago, we had seven billion stars the population of the world. Everybody thinks or likes to think that he is a star. All the parents like to see their kids stars. So we had the seven billion mark of world population two days ago, if you like to know that information. Now to uh, introduce sciences, stars, and our distinguished speaker, I am thankful for our Dean. Would you please give us a hint of what you do in sciences? My name is Gatson Obi. I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Sciences, and I have missed most of the presentations because of all the engagements on campus. But this one, um, I made time to come to. Uh, Dave Linton is my faculty member in physics and one of the well-known professors on campus because of his expertise uh, in astronomy. Am I right? Okay. Okay, <laughs> so today he is going to apply some of that science to an understanding of uh, ancient Egypt. And Dave, good luck. <laughs> now, if you wish upon a star, here it is. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you both, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I would start off by saying that uh, I noticed that all the slides seem to be shifted that way, so if you'll just lean, maybe it will help. Uh, but you probably got, uh, could be. That there, that's maybe the early indication that uh, you're going to miss a little bit off the right edge. And if that happens, um, uh, hopefully I can remember what it was because I can't see it on my screen here either. Um, but um, the stars, the sky, was, was extremely important to the Egyptians. Remember that this was a time when there was no light pollution on this planet. And this is a desert environment, and the skies were just gorgeous. It must have been. Um, we can only imagine if we're here in Illinois where it's not all that arid, fortunately, I guess, uh, and we do have some light pollution. Now, uh, before I uh, get going very far, I do want to uh, 
I, I have three disclaimers. One, uh, if you're expecting a talk on astrology based on the, the uh, mistake they got into the paper yesterday, uh, you may want to leave now. Uh, that that uh, there is a difference between astrology and astronomy, and I'm, I wish to speak on astronomy. Uh, secondly, I'd have to say I'm not an expert on, on uh, Egypt at all, um, although I have a significant interest in the history of astronomy, as it bears on astronomy itself. And thirdly, I've never even been to Egypt, although it's on my list. Um, more so now than when I started uh, reading up for this talk. So I, I guess maybe the next slide to look at is uh, this that was in the paper yesterday. And uh, I, I don't want to make fun of this. Uh, it was as much my mistake, uh, probably more my mistake than uh, anybody else's. I wasn't careful about communicating over the phone in a phone interview uh, what I should have been alert to as a, a very common misconception and, and confusion. Astrology and astronomy are not the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, yeah, you're even missing the punchline in this cartoon. That's bad. Um, I always get mixed up between astrology and astronomy. Which is the stupid, trivial one, and which is the one you get horoscopes in with? Uh, um, but um, astronomy is a science. Um, another one I will just skip through here. Uh, astrology, really a pseudoscience. It really is an ancient religion. Uh, it was a religion at a time in a variety of parts of the world, certainly in the Middle East, when uh, motions in the sky were quite mysterious, I was trying to make a sense of life and looking for correlations. Certainly there were seasonal correlations to be found in the heavens, timing of various things such as uh, lunar phases and, and seasons as well, uh, with um, ripening, ripening of berries, for example, or patterns of game. Um, and they looked further and they came to the conclusion or had the belief system that uh, where things were, where planets were, where the sun was amongst the stars, would have a bearing on how, what one's destiny might be, and that sort of thing. And uh, the predictions of astrology can now be tested, many of them, with uh, scientific methods, and they don't stand up. And at that point, I guess you stop calling it an ancient religion and say if you have a current belief in it, um, you're having to do some mental gymnastics to get pa past the, the evidence that says that where a star is or where a planet is um, simply doesn't have any effect. Um, but as I read that article and then thought about it a lot, because my initial reaction was just, oh my goodness, um, I realized, you know, it really is something that maybe I should mention here. Uh, astronomy has matured. We've learned things. Well, that's true in any science or any discipline, I would hope. And at the time the Egyptians, at the time we're talking about in ancient Egypt, astronomy was not what it is today. We didn't have telescopes, a long way from it. And astronomy and astrology were really one and the same. The priests were looking at the stars, they were mapping them, they were timing them, seeing when they set, when they rose, same thing for the sun and the moon. Um, planets, where they were in certain constellations, but also trying to, to uh, give the king his, uh, what he was requesting, his, um, whether this is a good year to go to war, perhaps, with the neighboring countries. Um, so astronomy and astrology, I'm sure I'm talking about both today. Now, I have never been to Egypt, but I have been to Africa. And um, I, I will say that I have been to the Sahara Desert. I've been on a camel. Uh, my wife and I and two of our children uh, 11 years ago for a uh, semester break went to um, Morocco. And we rode camels into the Sahara Desert and uh, on Christmas Day, no less, and uh, spent the night. And I even in the bazaar at uh, Marrakesh got to hold a cobra. Um, Check that one off. Not going to do it again. Um, saw a sign that said Timbuktu, 52 jours, meaning 52 days, this way, by camel, 52 days. Uh, that was in the oasis that we encountered the, well, that I had rented the camels, and we went out to uh, into the Sahara. So I've seen the western end. I haven't seen the eastern end of the Sahara. Um, 
Now, the sky, this part of the sky was one of the most special parts of the sky for the Egyptians. We know this is our winter sky. These constellations are there in the early evening in our winter. You see Orion there. The two knees, the three stars in a row for the belt, the two shoulders, the star that uh, is red at the top, one of the brightest stars in the sky. Betelgeuse is how it's usually mispronounced. Betelgeuse probably a bit better. Uh, the knee at the bottom is blue. These are two stars that are decidedly different in temperature. Um, but in different in temperature, the cooler star and the warmer, much hotter star, the blue one. Over here, the brightest star seen from the Earth. This is the star Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S. Um, and then in the upper right, we have Taurus the bull. We have the face of the bull. It's a V-shaped face right here. I jump up, but uh, probably would not be good for me. Okay, V-shaped face, the star Aldebaran, uh, the eye of the bull, and over here the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. Now, if you look low on the left, you see a transitory object, a meteor passing behind the trees. Got caught in this photograph here. Um, Sirius is in the constellation of the dog, Canis Major. That's the name it's given now. To the Egyptians, Orion came to be associated with one of their gods, Osiris. And Sirius came to be associated with Isis. Um, I think I've got some more slides here. Yes, there's Orion. Better view of it there. A lot of faint stars, stars that you cannot see from here under the lighting conditions that we have. Uh, here is a depiction from uh, somewhere in Egypt at some time. I don't know what the source of this is, but we have o Osiris being associated with uh, what we now call the hunter. And Isis, I'm sure that's what this must be, uh, right here. Remember, in fact, you can see here the belt. Remember from the previous slide that if you go down to the left uh, past the belt, it's pointing really to the star Sirius. Sirius is a star that rises in our southeast. It doesn't get real high, but it's very noticeable. Uh, it is exceeded in brightness only by the sun and the moon and by Venus and I think um, Jupiter at times is brighter than it is. Jupiter's in our sky right now in the east. Uh, if you go out any time of the evening uh, after the sun is set, it will be there for you. And Venus, even brighter, is now entering the, the western sky, but very early only. Um, Isis again, uh, making a trek across the sky. Now Sirius I'll talk more about. Uh, in fact, right here, the flooding of the Nile River, that was vital to the survival of the civilization and survival of the individuals within that civilization. Uh, most important annual event in Egypt. Uh, timing this, foretelling when it was going to happen, was a really important task that was given over to the priesthood. Uh, they found an astronomical uh, association with this, correlation, and that was the rising of Sirius. So what happens is that as we go around the sun, the stars that are behind the sun change. It looks to us as though if we could see the stars and the sun at the same time, and that's tough, but you can imagine that the sun, uh, if I put something in, in the middle of this uh, oval right here and I walked around the table, it would look to me as though that object in the middle was moving in front of the background individuals here. Um, the sun seems to move through the stars. Now, at a certain point in the year, it gets roughly in the direction of Sirius. Not exactly, but enough so that with all that light, it's going to make Sirius impossible to see. And then it goes past Sirius. And if you're watching early in the morning, looking to the east before sunrise, the day will come when Sirius can be seen rising just before the sun. It separated itself enough from the sun. And it was at that time that the Nile was found to be flooding in the capital city of Memphis, probably flooding further south earlier. Um, now, 70 days over that time span, Sirius cannot be seen due to its proximity to the sun. 
70 days. What you can't see too well is this slide off to the right. This is Osiris, uh, a green-skinned god, um, god that came to be associated with Orion and loosely with Sirius as well. And remember that these constellations disappear for a while. Remember that Osiris, or I haven't mentioned it, but you may know, Osiris is the god of the underworld. This is uh, mythologically associated with the uh, passage from life gone to the underworld. And this is the one god from ancient religions that actually was resurrected, had a resurrection, came back to life. But life was now being placed in charge of the, the underworld, the afterlife. Uh, the calendar um, is associated very strongly with um, with Sothis, which was one of the names that was used for Sirius. Sothis or Sothis. Uh, Sopdet, I believe. I'm trying to pronounce some of the words, I, I forget. Um, but... Uh, what they did was to start the year initially with the flooding of the Nile. Uh, started with the rising of Sirius just before the sun. They created a, a, a calendar that had 12 30-day months in it. The months were 30 days. The lunar cycle is 29 and a half days for the cycle of phases. So they were doing pretty much the same thing we do today in terms of the lengths of the months. But... Um, that would just give you 360. They had five days of fast feasting at the end, not fasting, but feasting. That E makes all the difference. And uh, three seasons of four months each. The first season was the season of the flooding of the Nile, the rise of the waters, the, the cresting of the waters, and the subsiding. The next season was the season of uh, cultivation. And the last season was the season of harvest. Now, the five-day feasting was uh, said to be unlucky for any work to be done. And we have a 365-day year. Now, how long is our year? Any astronomy students around? 365 and a quarter is a whole lot better, yes. So... The day um, is, or the year is off by about six hours. 365.2422 days, it, that is, um, is the uh, length of the year as we now understand it. So if they had 365 days in it, they were about a quarter day off, six, day, six hours, and so every four years they were going to be a day out of sync, their calendar was, with the flooding of the Nile, if the Nile was that regular. And eventually, uh, any variation that it had was swamped by the difference between the calendar and the flooding. Uh, this quarter day was adding up. Over 1,460 years, the rising of the Nile cycled through the seasons. The priests knew about the quarter day discrepancy, but they didn't care. The calendar had been created. It maybe they couldn't think of what to do, but um, they did notice that the stars were better, a better predictor of the rising of the Nile than their own calendar. 1,460 years. I think it's a testament to the duration, the longevity of the. Egyptian civilization, that they got to see this cycle through their calendar twice uh, since they create, after they created this, the uh, calendar in about 3000 BC, I think. I think that's about when it was put together. Uh, eventually, uh, 46 BC, we have Julius Caesar modifying the calendar by adding that February 29th every four years. But if you've paid attention to the news lately, it was in 1582. Uh, much more recently, Pope Gregory VIII. That's 13, isn't it? Yeah. 
13. <laughs> okay, he modified the calendar again because adding six hours on the average, adding that one day every four years is too much. That would make it at 365.25, and really it's just slightly less. So um, the century years are leap years only if they're divisible by 400. 2000 was a leap year. Probably none of the rest of us need to worry about uh, any more of those, but um, come 2100, you can warn your kids, your grandkids, that's going to be different. Um, now that I think I have mentioned all of this, yes, the rotation of the Earth is very steady. Uh, just summarize it by that. Now, it's interesting to note that the priests were watching the sky, and they're going to, I'm going to be focusing on one more thing that they were doing especially. Um, they're keeping records, but there are certain things that they didn't notice, things that their neighbors to the east, the Babylonians, did over the course of several thousand years. They noticed the, the sorrow cycle, 18 years, 11 days, 8, eight hours. Now, this wasn't actually noticed by the Babylonians until uh, the, the reign of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I believe it was, in the uh, 8th century BC, where he really promoted science. Uh, it was said by uh, Claudius Ptolemy some uh, 1,000 years later almost, a little bit under that, that uh, that was really the beginning of uh, real astronomy right there. He asked his uh, astronomers to pour through the records of old. They'd been keeping records, but now take a look at them. See what you can find. And what they found was that eclipses happen in cycles. And for example, um, if you mark in your calendar, August 21st of 2017, head to Carbondale. Uh, because that's going to be the center, on the center line of the next solar eclipse in this part of the world. And... 18 years, 11 days later, that would be 2035. We have another one, and um, I believe it is this one right here. I think that's it, but I think it's off the screen in terms of the labeling. Um, why is it in another part of the world? Because of the extra eight hours. The Earth gets another eight hours to rotate, so that puts it further west by a third of a rotation of the Earth. And then in 2053, September 12th, again advancing forward 11 days, although it may seem like only 10 in some cases. It depends how many leap years are in between these particular dates as to whether the dates really seem to be 11 days apart. But we're going to have another one uh, in this same cycle. And this one actually passes... Um, apparently right through Egypt. Um, there are other cycles going on at the same time. We don't have to wait 18 years between eclipses. Other cycles are happening as well. They discovered this by looking at the data. For example, uh, if we go to 2024, we get to uh, see another solar eclipse, and if you happen to be in Carbondale, you can just wait for 18, for uh, what, from 2017 to 2024, just sit there and wait, and you have the shadow of the moon passing across you. And others happen too, but this is just a different sorrow cycle. Um, also, the Babylonians were paying attention to the planets and discovering some things about the planets. The planets, uh, for example, are changing directions. Um, this is Mars at probably about a one-week interval, um, photographed against fixed stars. And obviously, the stars are moving across the sky, but if you freeze those in your frame or on your print, then Mars is a wanderer, and that's really what planet means, wanderer. They didn't know what the planets were, they associated them with gods, goddesses, Mars and Venus, for example, the Roman names for god of war and goddess of love. But this uh, changing of direction right this, like this was really very difficult to explain. And they worked on the timings, trying to understand that. The Egyptians, though they were aware of these phenomena, um, didn't pour into the data to find the cycles, um, didn't seem to be that interested in this phenomenon either, and probably the reason was that it didn't correlate with the flooding of the Nile at all. That was survival. When I talk about bringing astronomy down to Earth, bringing the sky down to Earth, 
their focus was on survival. Uh, focus was on that flooding of the Nile, keeping the king happy. That's always a good idea. Um, by the way, up here you see the Pleiades again. Looks like a little dipper. And um, anybody know what Pleiades means in Japanese? Yes, you do. Some of you do. Next time you see a Subaru vehicle, look for the stars on it. That's the emblem, and that's what, that's what that means. Uh, from the African uh, uh, continent, further south than Egypt, we get a glimpse, perhaps, an idea of what the skies of old must have been like. This is the Milky Way, um, photographed from Botswana. And the southern Milky Way as well. You have the dust lanes that lie between the stars, the dust from dead stars that's built up there and, and dims the more distant objects in the sky. Um, really, the dust lanes are the most the densest parts of the sky. Take a look at this um, glyph, I would call it, I guess, as general, from, uh, from Egypt. What you have here is the sky goddess, and her name is spelled N-U-T, and I believe it's pronounced Newt. Um, and what does that look like to you? Maybe I shouldn't ask it in such open terms, but I'm trying to correlate it with the Milky Way arching overhead. Um, what you've got also is the earth god, Geb, uh, separated from the heavens by the god of the air. It's holding up and keeping the two apart. Um, other things are in there, and um, I don't think I'll go into those. Um, another one that I uh, would suggest to you is this one. Many times you see the, the goddess Newt uh, symbolized with star uh, representations along her body. That's the same thing. Okay. Now, let's turn our attention again in Africa and look to the south. And south point on the horizon right below the center of these circles. This is a two-hour exposure of the southern sky from south of the equator. And what you find is that the stars are rising in the east. Well, the ones that do at least. This is due south, so east is over here. So some of the stars out here are rising in the east, going around the pole the point that's over here, the south pole of the Earth, and then setting west of due south. Uh, they're moving in clockwise circles. They do the similar sort of thing in the northern hemisphere. If you look towards Polaris, they are moving in circles, but they're moving again from east to west, but now because you're looking the opposite direction, it's counterclockwise. And the stars within this circle are the stars that would be circumpolar as seen from roughly Alexandria. Alexandria is at a latitude of about 31 degrees. We are closer to 40 degrees. And consequently, the stars that are always overhead, always above our horizon, more correctly, are the stars that come right down to the bottom of the screen. The Big Dipper skims the northern horizon at its lowest point and gets up to an altitude that's almost straight overhead, about 80 degrees tops uh, when it's highest in the sky. The point Polaris, or right close to Polaris, is the point amongst the stars that lies exactly overhead the north pole of the Earth. And as Earth rotates, as we now understand, the stars look like they're moving. Really, we're turning. But that turning and along this axis makes that point seem motionless. If you're at the north pole, point straight up, and the Earth turns, you keep pointing at the same spot amongst the stars. That's uh, less than a degree away from Polaris, so that is our North Star. Okay, uh, to the Egyptians, um, the Northern Stars gave a permanence, uh, a sense of permanence. They're always there. They're north of the hemis north of the equator, uh, so they're gonna, their attention is going to be drawn much more to the Northern sky than to the Southern sky uh, for any sense of that. And For the pharaohs, 
the belief arose that once they would die, they would have a chance at immortality through being transported to the northern sky, where it was where you'd always be up there, become one of those stars, one of those seven billion stars, except at night you don't quite see seven billion, but there's a lot of them out there on a clear, clear night. Now, we've got the two pointer stars there that help us, and the Big Dipper, that help us to find Polaris. Um, the problem is that the pole star is wandering. Eh, not the pole star, but the pole is wandering. Why is it wander? Because the Earth is wobbling. If you, um, and I think maybe I'll just look ahead here, if you take a top and you spin it on the kitchen table or the kitchen floor, some hard surface, spin it with it leaning, it's going to spin, its axis doesn't keep pointing in the same direction. If you don't spin it, it falls over. But if you spin it, you get this precession right here. The Earth is spinning like a top, and it's not sitting on the table, but gravity's pulling on it. Gravitational pull of the sun and the moon are trying to get it to fall over. It's got an equatorial bulge. The equatorial diameter is about um, 70 kilometers more than the polar diameter. Um, trying to get it to fall over. But the spinning causes it to do this. It takes 26,000 years for, our, for the pole star to switch from Polaris to Vega and back to Polaris, for example. But we're looking at a time um, when the sky was a bit different. We look back to 3000 BC and the North Celestial Pole, the point directly overhead the North Pole of the Earth, was very close to the star Thuban in Draco. I think it's also known as Draconis. Um, since then, it has moved along. Finally, we get to Polaris, and then about now, close to Polaris. Um, for the pharaohs entombed in the pyramids or in other burial sites, they had, according to their beliefs, they had to prepare to go north. So what the priest did was to line up the buildings along the north-south axis. And of course the opposite sides, the adjacent sides would be east-west. How do you do that? Well, the technique in about 2500 BC was to focus on the star Kochab, Kochab and the star down here at the bend of the handle of the Big Dipper known as Mizar. Mizar, Mizar, M-I-Z-A-R. Um, because the pole was directly between these two points. Now, this is 3000 BC, but as you move along right here, as the pole does, it's right here. So they could find that. They knew by watching during that time that that was due north, but these two stars flanked the pole star perfectly, They're equidistant. And they were kind of like, um, uh, I use a, a phrase that's actually applied to a couple of other stars, uh, the guardians of the pole. They were the guardians for the pharaohs really. So it lined up for this. Well, what happens? They keep doing this over time. This works perfectly in, I believe the year was 2467 BC. Yes, 2467 BC. That worked fine for finding north, but after a little bit of time, a few years, a few centuries, there's plenty of centuries to the Egyptians in that civilization, uh, the pole has wandered, so instead of a point right in between being motionless in the sky and marking the point directly over the north point on the, on the horizon, if you find that point in the sky and line your building up with it, and this point over here is due north, you've, maybe you've not done your pharaoh any favors. And so we can look at the buildings now, and we can tell when they were built by how much the sides deviate from a north-south line because of this wandering. So astronomy and archaeology um, have uh, benefited from each other's contributions. 
and that has now been dated. The, the Great Pyramid was uh, has been dated uh, by this method to have been constructed in 2480 BC within plus or minus 10 years based on this uh, alignment consideration. Um, let's see, let's uh, look in here. This is a more detailed view of Kochab over here. This is Beta uh, Ursa Minor, uh, second brightest star in that constellation. And then we've got uh, Mizar, Mizar right in here. It's actually two stars together. It's a, it's a binary star. Um, they're far enough apart that uh, it's been a test of good vision since at least the time of the Romans, if you could see them separated. Uh, but right between this star and this star, you've got Thuban almost right between it, but the pole was moving this way, and I know I turned the slide, so I played around with doing this, but I'm not real happy with that for obvious reasons, trying to read it. But each, each uh, age seems to have its way to find the pole. We have the means of finding the two stars in the Big Dipper, and drawing a line out of it, almost a perfectly straight line, about five times the separation here, leads you to Polaris. It's not an appreciably, an extremely bright star, but it is motionless. It uh, helps you find directions. For uh, a point about 4,500 years ago, find this star in the, the bend of the handle of the Big Dipper, find this star, which is the second brightest star in Ursa Minor, and halfway in between them, you've got the point that once you drop your gaze straight down to the horizon, you're looking due north. Um, one speculation, and I don't know enough to be convinced of this yet. Um, some claim it's true and some um, dispute that. Is that. The three small pyramids here are representative of the belt of Orion. And certainly there was a connection between the gods, uh, God of Cyrus, um, it's also identified as the first pharaoh, um, where that is uh, a mythological, mythological characterization or not, I'm not sure, but certainly that was very important and perhaps that's um, what this was supposed to represent. Uh, major buildings in, in Egypt were built to align with stars or with the sun here we have uh, portions in this slide and I think just one more slide that I ended up including uh, from the temple of Amun-Ra at uh, Karnak. Immense columns. Um, I, this morning, almost snatched up another picture I found on the internet and put it on there because it had some people in the picture and it, I couldn't believe how tiny they were compared to the height of these columns. These columns are about 100 feet tall. Um, just a little under it, 29 meters. You do the you do the math, okay? Um, they're tall, and um, this arrangement of pillars permits the rising sun to enter only on one day of the year to the inner sanctum, and that day, um, the first day of, hmm. Well, that's curious that it was blocked out because I had two sources that disagreed as to what day it was. Uh, one was the, the first day of winter and the other source said the first day of summer and I had not had my chance to track down which that was. But uh, the uh, projector <laughs> alignment has taken care of that for me. Uh, I'm not sure. But it was a significant day and um, it took some engineering to get the pillars placed in just the right way or the corners of doorways, the edges of doorways in just the right positions so that this shaft of light could make it all the way down a very long hallway um, to the uh, sanctuary. Not um, to be overlooked is the, the fact that they did have these great clear skies. And one, one thing that I would comment on, um, actually from my experience in Morocco, I went to Morocco with my family at the time of uh, Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan ended uh, quite uh, coincidentally on the first day, on, on Christmas Day, that particular year. And the Islamic calendar 
is a lunar calendar that also does not sync with the seasons. It's way out of sync uh, compared to what the Egyptians had. The Egyptians were off by six hours. This is out of sync by, well, 29 and a half days per month per lunar cycle times 12 months. The, the months all start when they sight the crescent moon in the evening. Um, where do they sight it? In Cairo. That's where the official place is. Um, that would be 354 days. So it's going to be about 11 and a quarter days off. Um, every year. And now, um, what, 11 years after we were there, that's close to, what, four months earlier. And eventually you get to the point where you're celebrating Ramadan not in the wintertime, but you're celebrating in the summer, and you're supposed to go, you're supposed to fast during the daylight hours. Well, that's a longer time come June than it is in December. And it's uh, a much... Uh, much more of a, a challenge. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It's not important to them, uh, to the uh, practitioners, the followers of that of, uh, of Islam, that the calendar be synced to the seasons. They just simply have, I imagine, uh, in the modern day, they would have uh, calendars that uh, carry both dates, planners that have both calendars religious uh, activities as well as uh, activities that conform to the calendar that the modern business world is following. Um, I want to talk about uh, one of the greatest um, achievements, perhaps, by a scientist of more than 2,000 years ago. This was uh, about 2200 BC. The man's name was Eratosthenes. He was a librarian. Here we are in the library. How can I pass up the opportunity to talk about a librarian. Um, he was uh, nicknamed Beta. It was said that he was second best in the world in everything. He was just, he was a cartographer. He was a mathematician. He was really good, but one tops in his any field. Uh, but his job was to acquire information. And one day from far up the Nile, and that's where the modern high dam Aswan is. Those of you over here, that's where it is. Syene was the name of the, of the little town there, uh, came a report to Alexandria that uh, the sun was straight overhead at noon on the first day of summer. The sunlight went all the way to the bottom of the wells. The tall poles cast no shadows. Now, the idea was already established that the world was round. If you've heard, as many of us uh, were taught, that uh, Columbus set sail at a time when the, the populace understood the world to be flat, that's a flat-out falsehood. That... Um, Ain't so. Um, this uh, was established long before that. Aristotle, 150 years before Eratosthenes, had uh, taken the reports of travelers who had gone to the north and said, hey, the North Star is higher. And those who had gone to the south said, hey, the North Star is lower. And said, oh, the Earth must be round. And he wrote that, and Aristotle's word was taken as uh, the authority in science. Er Eratosthenes, when he reads this, says, don't know what he said for sure, uh, but uh, I really imagine that he checked the sky, the sun, on the first day of summer in Alexandria. And he did not find that it was straight overhead. Now, on a flat Earth, if it's straight overhead, Syene, it's going to be straight overhead in Alexandria. But on a curved Earth, it can go down the well there and cause the poles here to cast shadows. And he didn't stop there. He thought about it, realized that he had a means here of going further. If uh, he could measure the how far the in angle the sun was away from being straight overhead, the zenith, he measure that difference, he would have the same angle that these two lines would vertical lines would intercept at the at the uh, center of the Earth, and it turns out to be just the difference in latitude. 7.2 degrees, approximately. Um, so he measured the shadow angle, the deviation from the um, from straight overhead. And then what else does he need to go further? Well, what's he after? He's got this distance, and he's got the whole distance around the Earth. This angle right here, 7.2 degrees, what's the entire angle? It's 360. Whole distance around the Earth 
certainly I don't know that if I'm living in Egypt 4,500 years, well, 2,200 years ago. Um, but maybe I don't even know how far it is to Syene. Several stories um, come about here. One of them, that he paid for a survey to be conducted, paid for someone who was a pacer and a counter to hike the distance, which was um, 5,000 stadia. This was the distance unit used by the Greeks at the time. About 5,000 stadia. Um, and um, 7.2 degrees is about one is exactly 1 50th of uh, the, the uh, a complete circular angle. So he was looking at that distance. If he could measure it to be one, there's, that equation is wrong, isn't it? Not 1 50th times s, but uh, s divided by a 50th, 50 times s. Take the distance s and multiply it by 50. How embarrassing. I got one of my equations wrong. Um, and how close did he come? Uh, the value that he uh, found was about 45,000, maybe closer to 45,500 kilometers in modern units. The accepted value today is a little bit over 40,000 kilometers, about 40,080 around the equator, 40,075. But I put a question mark and an asterisk over on the right there because there is doubt about uh, transferring, converting his units of stadia to kilometers because the stadium as a unit of length was the length of the Olympic Stadium and by this point in time there had been several and they weren't all the same length. So his worst results are right here. This is as far off as he could have been apparently. Uh, if you give him credit for the using the stadium that would have given him the best results, he was off by maybe 1%. Uh, in any case, how much of the world is known in Egypt or in Greece or the Mediterranean at that time? It's the Mediterranean. It's maybe as far as Babylonia and then beyond, maybe a touching India a little bit. And maybe there's a sense of just how little of the world they know when they can see the size of the world there. When Columbus goes before the College of Scientists prior to 1492 to argue his case for being granted, being given a grant to uh, sail westward to India and Japan, they said, you're out of your mind. Uh, look how big the world is. Look how far that is. You can't carry enough provisions to get there. Uh, he tried other arguments, but this measurement uh, was cited. This uh, measurement had been reproduced in other ways, and the size of the world was known, as well as its shape. I leave you here um, with one um, more look at the Milky Way from a very dark location. I think it's a beautiful view. And um, we have gained greatly in our modern society from, and certainly in our, our science of astronomy, from the dark, clear skies of the Middle East. I thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Any questions, starry questions? This microphone is not for sound, but for taping. So if you have a question, I'll give you this to tape it questions about stars. I have a question, just general one. When you see all these dots in the sky, yes. why is it that people say connect this and this and this and make this shape, not this and this and make the other shape? I mean, That's a very good question. Uh, your eyes tend to be drawn to the brighter stars, and I, uh, I will offer a supposition, not a, a certain answer, but um, if you have in your culture some stories to tell, and those stories are about heroes and villains, and you're sitting around the campfire and telling that story, um, you probably don't have an easel and a marker to make to draw it out. But boy, you can get creative with dots that are just up there in many different places, and you can maybe find some creative ways to uh, put your uh, to illustrate your story. Yes, I mean, uh, and then that gets handed down around the campfire and on to uh, an age when maybe it's written down.
I became time honored or something. I think so. Any other questions? Wish upon a star. Okay, since uh, we have no questions, that means we have all the answers. So, okay. join with me. In, uh, <laughs> thank you.